Luke chapter 7, I'm going to read the first 10 verses. And no, this isn't the story of Palm Sunday. As I looked ahead in our study, we've been going through the book of Luke, and I've shared with you before, whenever we come up to a holiday, I, I wonder, okay, what, what should I do? You know, Lord, should we stop our study and, and look at the passage that has to do with this holiday? And granted, Palm Sunday is not recognized apart from the church as a holiday, but within the church we recognize this day. This is the day that Jesus proclaimed himself as king. This is the day as we look at scripture when Jesus, that first day of the week, he rode a donkey, uh, a little donkey's foal actually, into the gates of Jerusalem. He did it in fulfillment of scripture. He was making a proclamation that nobody mistook. The Jews of that day understood exactly what he was doing. He was fulfilling scripture. And the amazing thing was that up until that time, he had been telling everybody, keep quiet. Don't proclaim me as king. Don't proclaim me as king. And, you know, if, if you were a marketer and you looked at Jesus' strategy, you would have said, this guy didn't know what he was doing. Because during the times that the people would have taken him and made him a king, he said, don't talk about it. And he waited until the moment when he knew that it would end up with him on the cross. And then he proclaimed himself as king. When he said, go get that donkey, I'm going to ride it into town. Everybody, as they cried out, like we say, Hosanna. They, they proclaimed him the son of David. They proclaimed him there the Messiah and their king. And the problem was that the people in the streets were ready to make him a physical king. And they thought they were about to go to war against Rome and be led by a powerful conqueror that Jesus, or that God had sent, and that Jesus would give them victory over Rome. But he had been establishing the fact that his kingdom wasn't like that at all. And in fact, he taught so many things. We looked at, at the Sermon on the Plain, which we, we realized, we don't know for sure if it's the same as the Sermon on the Mount, but it had the same aspects of it where Jesus completely switched the values of everything. Everything the world says is valuable, he said, that's not valuable. And the things that the world really demeans, he said, those are the things that are important. And I want you to see as we consider this Palm Sunday, Jesus speaks specifically about authority. And actually, it's not so much what Jesus said in the passage you were about to read. It's what somebody else said. And then how Jesus responded to him. I want you to pay close attention to how Jesus responds to the person in this passage as we read it today. We're going to read from Luke 7, verses 1 through 10. And it has everything to do with Jesus being king. It has everything to do with what it means for Jesus and for us to exercise authority. This is all about the kind of authority that Jesus established in his kinghood over our lives. When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. And a centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. And when he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He, the he here is the centurion, he is worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, now get this, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy. I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. 
For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man... Okay. Everybody, look up here. You have to pay attention to this next verse. You have to pay attention to this next verse. Look at verse 8. For I also am a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him. Okay, he marveled at him. Who's the he? Who's the him? Who's the he? Who's the him? Jesus. Who's Jesus? How do you cause the Son of God to marvel? How do you cause God to marvel? That's what this passage describes. There's something happening here that caused Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to marvel. Now when Jesus heard this, he, Jesus, marveled at him, the centurion, and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Today's Palm Sunday. Everybody raise your palms to the Lord. He is worthy of our praise. He's our King. They raise palms to Him. We, we have these palms with us. And the Bible talks about raising your hands to the Lord. And we raise our hands to glorify Him because He's worthy of glory. He is the King. He is the Lord. He has all authority. And as we come to this passage, I want to talk to you not about the historical event, which I believe absolutely took place. Jesus literally got on a donkey. He literally rode through the gates of Jerusalem. He literally is a king. And he is king. And his kingdom exists wherever people serve him as king. If you want the kingdom of God to exist where you are, then be submitted to him as king. And the kingdom of God is right there. Amen? Amen. And Jesus has authority. But we need to understand what authority is. The fact is, the world does not understand authority. And frankly, sometimes in the church, we do not understand authority. Now, I'm going to just share something with you and give you a forewarning. I don't know if the rest of you have heard, but down in Corcoran, in a couple of weeks, on April 12th, Brother Jason Mayhill is going to be ordained. And I've been asked to come and preach the charge to him. And there's someone else that he's invited to come and preach the charge to the church. And I'm going to preach this sermon. I'm going to, it's going to be a little bit different. But I'm going to talk to him because he is going to be the pastor. He is the pastor. He's serving as a pastor. But we, we're going to ordain him as a pastor. And that is a role that some people look at as a position of authority. Now, I have never found it to be one of great power and authority. I know there are pastors that run the church in a certain way that it seems like, boy, they're in charge of everything. And the thing is, I don't have a bunch of people coming up to me all the time saying, Pastor, what do you want me to do? In fact, if, if a couple of you would do that this week, that would make me feel great, okay? Uh, the thing is, there are some pastors, though, that run things like they're the king of the church. Has anybody ever met a pastor like that? There are a lot of Christians that run their lives like, I'm the king, listen to me. And a pastor who thinks he's the king of the church is misunderstood. A Christian who thinks he's the king of his life is misunderstanding what it means to be a Christian. And so as we look at this passage, we need
need to understand what authority is all about. When Jesus came as a king, it is, for, for, it is very significant that Jesus came first as a suffering servant. He is going to come as conquering king. But before he did that, he had every right to come initially as conquering king. The fact is that the story of creation and God being our creator was something that every nation in the world knew at one point. And the reason they lost that knowledge was because they turned away from the creator God. God has revealed himself from the very beginning of history. And there is no one that has an excuse. And Jesus could have come initially as a conquering king and been absolutely right in doing it. He didn't. He came as a suffering servant willing to give his life on the cross to meet our need. Amen. We needed a Savior, so he became our Savior. But he is coming as a conquering king for those who have rejected him as Savior. And what he has done as our king and the way in which he came illustrates the nature of authority, power, and ability. La naturaleza de autoridad, poder, capacidad. And this understanding authority is important because Jesus pointed out what happened in this passage. Now, now you could say that these two things are unrelated. What is the relationship of faith and authority? As Christians, I've encouraged you that we need to recognize that God has placed us right where we're at, every one of us. Not here in the church. Wherever you're going tomorrow, wherever you're going the rest of the week, God has placed you there. And God expects you to have an impact where you go. God expects you to have an influence. God, in fact, expects us to have power wherever we go. Can I just re remind you of what Jesus said in Acts 1 7? Does anybody remember that verse? Anybody remember Acts 1 7? That's a good memory verse for you to memorize. Jesus said, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Before we can be his witnesses, we need to have what? Power. We need to have power in order to be a witness who has an influence. Now, what I'm su suggesting here is that not the, the kind of overpowering type of influence that every single person is just going to be blown away by you. Okay? I don't think that that's the kind of power. It's not the kind of power that everybody is impressed with how powerful we are. If we have the kind of power that Jesus is talking about, our lives will influence people to be impressed with His power, not ours. But when He moves in our life in such a way that people are influenced to recognize his power, not ours. That is power. How in the world do you achieve that? How in the world do you achieve that? Through great faith. Through great faith. Faith and power. Jesus said if you even have a little mustard seed of faith, what will happen? You'll say to this mountain, it will be removed. Anybody remove any mountains this week? Now, I'm going to tell you, that's something that I don't think he meant literally. I think that was figurative speech. But the thing is, some of you have had mountains in your life that God has removed because you obeyed him in faith. Faith moves mountains. Faith is the key to authority and power in our lives. And Jesus said in this passage... In fact, he was marveling so much because he said, this is an expression of great faith greater than I've seen in all of Israel. How many of you want to have great faith? This passage demonstrates how to have it. Now, you can go home and you can tune in on your radio or your TV 
and you can listen to somebody preach about how great faith is the kind of faith that is so powerful that you can make God do what you want Him to do. Has anybody heard any preachers like that lately? You can make God make you rich. You can make God make you popular. God just wants to overflow your life with all kinds of blessings and wealth and bounty. Now that's not what Jesus said, but that's what some preachers say. Here's what Jesus said was great faith. Let me just say to you, what Jesus said was great faith is exactly the opposite of what most people think great faith is. Let's look at it again. Because Jesus gives us the important demonstration of what great faith is. Before I go on, though, this is still in the introduction, okay? That's why it still says introduction. If you read Matthew's account of the same thing, oh wait, <laughs> that's okay, just did it. All right, there we are. And by the way, I, can you tell what that is? I hate it when I look at these great pictures on the computer and then when it's up here, you can't really tell what it is. That's a volcano, okay? I have taken some pictures that demonstrate powerful things, powerful things. And we're surrounded by things that God has made that are so much more powerful than anything man has ever made. One volcano eruption, I, I don't have the stats, but, but I guess, you know, there's all kinds. It's, it's as, as powerful as multiple atomic bombs. And, and that's a volcano eruption right there. But Jesus says that there's a demonstration of power that goes on here. And Matthew records this account also. And in Matthew, this is one of those things that people say, oh, look, the Bible's wrong, because in Matthew's account, the centurion comes directly to Jesus. And in this account, he sends servants, or actually, he sends, not servants, excuse me, it's on behalf of his servant, he sends some Jewish representatives. Now, why in the world would he do that? Because the centurion, obviously, we know that he honored the Jewish faith. He built them a synagogue. And he knew that a Gentile could cause a Jew to become unclean. And he, as a centurion, what was a centurion? He was a Roman soldier who was in charge of at least 100 other soldiers. This was a man with authority. This was a man with power. And as a Roman, he was not naturally considered very favorably by Jews because the Romans were the ones who had political power over the Jews at that time. But this centurion had recognized the faith of the Jews. He had honored them by building them a synagogue, and he was held in favor by these Jewish leaders. So he asked them to please go and represent him. Matthew did not record that detail because Matthew, see Matthew's account emphasizes Jesus as king. And Matthew's main point was to communicate about power and authority. But Luke, emphasizing the humanity of Christ and always taking the side of humanity, I believe he was expressing something about the centurion, and he was, he was including a detail Matthew didn't include. The fact that he sent representatives didn't change the fact that he was asking for Jesus to heal his servant. It was not a detail that Matthew considered that significant to what he was saying. But Luke includes this because he is emphasizing the humanity of this situation. And as we look at this centurion, we learn that he has a servant. What was the relationship of a servant to a, to a Roman citizen? Anybody know from history? He was property. He was property. Now, when we think of slavery in this country, we think of a racial thing. Sadly, slavery has been something that existed since the beginning of time. And it wasn't on the basis of race. There, were, there, there has been slavery all throughout human history. And we're not talking about difference in skin color or anything. We're talking about oftentimes national background and so on. One nation would conquer another nation and they would bring those citizens into slavery. And in the Roman government, a slave was considered property. A Roman could kill a slave without violating the law, depending on what 
he was being disciplined for. They considered them to be property. And yet, look at the passage. A centurion slave who was highly regarded by him. Highly? Does a Roman centurion highly regard a slave? Not normally. Not normally. And this slave, as he was sick and about to die, he found <coughs> compassion in the eyes of this centurion. And so I want you to put the first point in your notes, please. True authority is compassionate. Una verdadera autoridad es compasivo. He was moved for his servant's life. He was moved for his servant's life. Now what happens when you've got a sick person in your home? Everybody else has to take care of them. I deal with this all the time. Everybody I visit, if they're not in a facility, the whole family is focused on taking care of them. When there's a hospice patient in a home, they become the center of that home. Everything revolves around that person because a sick person needs attention. A sick person oftentimes can't get up and walk to the bathroom. They can't get up and fix themselves a meal. They become the focus of the whole home. And so here was someone that was not discarded at his time of need. This is a person who was sick and about to die, and this centurion was not ready to just be done with him. He was not only concerned about him, but he was willing to seek the help of Jewish leaders to go to Jesus and to ask for his healing. There was compassion in this man. And let me just suggest to you that this is a teaching of Scripture. True authority is always compassionate. And in fact, here is a teaching of Scripture. All leaders are to be... Now just imagine the way if you, if you were reading a book about success in business, think about how that sentence might finish. All leaders are to be what? Well, the Bible teaches this. All leaders are to be servants. All leaders are to be servants. Now, there's a verse that I refer to all the time. Jesus taught what true greatness was. Greatness is a word that we identify with power and authority. But Jesus said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, don't be like the Gentiles. Don't be like the people in the world. In fact, you're to be completely opposite to them. Because people in the world, when they have authority, they lord it over others. But if you want to be great, be the servant of all. And the word that he uses there can be translated, be the slave of all. True leaders are to be servants. But I'm, I'm not going to refer to that verse. See how I'm not referring to that verse? I'm going to refer to a different verse. I'm going to refer to the last chapter of the book of John. You remember Simon Peter. We talked last week about how he was the proto-apostle. He was the first preacher of the church. But he was also the one who said to Jesus, even if everybody else denies you, I'll never deny you, what did he do? Denied him three times. You're going to be hearing the story of the cross this week. If you're listening to Christian radio, uh, where this is the Passion Week. And you might hear references to this story where Jesus was being taken and they were preparing him for his crucifixion. And Peter, who just had said, I'll never deny you, denied him three times. And so, to respond to that, in the, in the 21st chapter of John, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the apostles. Peter had said, I'm going fishing, and the other apostles went with him, and they fished all night and caught nothing. And they, they saw somebody on the shore, and he says, throw on the other side. And as I've shared with you before, I'm sure they had already done that, but they threw on the other side. And Peter pulls in this, this net full of fish. John says, it's the Lord. And I love the line that it says, Peter threw himself into the water. He was in the boat, and if Jesus was on shore, he wanted to be on shore. And he just threw himself into the water. He wanted to be close to Jesus. But then what happened after that? Jesus fed them breakfast. And at, during the breakfast, he said, 
Peter, do you love me? How many times did he say it? Three times. Even as Peter had fallen, Jesus restored him three times with this question. Peter, do you love me? And I want to read to you the third time. Well, excuse me. I'm going to read to you the whole interchange. Look in your notes, John 21, 15 through 17. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my lambs. Now there's all kinds of things that you can draw from this passage. But what I want you to see is that before Jesus was denied by Peter, what was Peter saying? Peter was saying, I'm going to be better than all the rest of these guys. They're going to deny you, but I won't. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be better than them. I'm going to be above them. I'm going to do better. I'm going to have power. I'm going to stand strong. And now what is Jesus saying to Peter? You love me? Don't be better than them. Take care of them. Serve them. Tend them. Feed them. This is the proto-apostle of the church. This is the lead guy. This is the number one preacher. And what is Jesus' message for him? Serve. Serve. You want to be number one? Serve. Tend. Take care of them. And Peter learned the lesson, I believe, because when he turned around in his letter and wrote to the leaders of the church, look at what it says in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, I exalt the, exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Exercising oversight, listen to this, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, not for what you can get out of it, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be the examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading glory, crown of glory. He's saying what was told to him. He said, if you're going to be an elder in the church, if you're going to be a leader in the church, take care of the flock. And then when Jesus comes, that's when you get your reward. That's when you get your reward. I shared with you before, I think one of the most instructive things about spiritual life is being a parent. Because after all, you know, the scripture says that God is our father. And there's two ways of, of approaching parenting. There are parents that feel like their kids exist to make them happy. There are parents that feel like their kids exist to make them look good. This, frankly, is why pastor's kids are notorious for being horrid. I'll just be honest with you. And the whole time I've been your pastor, you haven't had to deal with my kids because they're grown. But there was a time when I was pastoring churches and my kids were right there. And I'll be honest with you. I worried about how my kids made me look. You can't help it, I don't think. And everybody knows that church is a place you go to keep everybody convinced that everything's perfect in your life. <laughs> I mean, that's how a lot of people go to church. And frankly, there's a lot of pastors that go to church that way. Got to make sure that the family acts in a way that makes me look good. 
And trying to find that right balance where I did not do that, frankly, was not an easy thing to do. And now that we're past the growing up of my kids and they're in their 30s, they still look back and feel, you know, have feelings that I wish I could have prevented because there were times that being the pastor's kid was hard on them. And the reality is, parents, if you're going to approach parenting like the Bible says that you should, your children are heritage from God. Your children are somebody that he has entrusted to you so that you can raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now let me just suggest to you, influencing other people to do what is right is very difficult, even when they're your own kids. We are first and foremost responsible for our own behavior. We are first and foremost responsible that we do the right thing. And parents, guess what? You can do the right thing and have your kids not turn out well. Now you can go to church in some churches and they'll say things that make it sound like if your kids didn't turn out well, it's your fault. Well, let me just say something else. I don't think it's possible to go through the process of parenting and do everything right. If you love your children, and if you desire God's best for your children, and if you commit yourself to doing your very best to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, I can guarantee you wonderful guilt feelings when you get older. <laughs> because you will recognize that you did not do everything right. But even if you do the majority of things right, your children will still make up their own minds. And kids, listen to me. Everybody, look at, everybody under 21, look at me right now. Don't you dare get to a point in your life and think that you can blame your parents for you doing the wrong thing. Because guess what? There are parents who don't do anything right and their kids grow up right because they make the right decisions themselves. We're responsible to do the very best thing for our children. And by the way, kids, if your parents are doing the very best thing for you, they will not always say yes to your demands. If your parents love you, there are times they are going to have to tell you no, and they're going tell you do it my way because God has given to you them to you as parents because they know more than you and so children need to submit to their parents but parents even though they are guiding their children even though they have the responsibility to lead their children are actually kids don't listen to this part called by God to serve their children not serve them by doing what they want, but serve them by doing what they need. Service is not giving somebody what they want. It is giving them what they need, even when it's sacrificial and costly to you. Amen. Why? Because true authority is coming. A parent looks at his child and desires God's best for that child and is willing to sacrifice, is willing even to become unpopular with that child that he loves, to do what they need rather than what they want. A boss. How many of you are bosses at work? You've got people who work under you. Okay, let's get more in line. How many of you have a boss? All right, there we go. <laughs> But the reality is, if you really stop and think about it, there are people who you are responsible to influence. And this is what it would be wonderful for your boss to do. If your boss was totally motivated out of what was best for everyone who works for the company. That's what a boss should do. But each of us, with our areas of responsibility, we have the responsibility to seek the good of those we're responsible for. Let me go to point number two, true authority. 
True authority is humble. Una verdadera autoridad es humilde. True authority is humble. I want you to stop and think a second. Did everybody notice the opinions of the people in this, in this story? When the people, when the Jewish leaders came to Jesus and spoke about the centurion, what did they say of him? What was that? Okay, he, there's a particular word I'm looking for. It's worthy. Worthy. Okay, that's the word that be. The reason I'm looking for that is because it's repeated by the centurion. The centurion uses the same word. He uses the word worthy too. The only problem is the Jewish leaders came and said, this guy's worthy. This guy's worthy. And the centurion, he sent his other servants saying, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Matter of opinion. Matter of opinion. Could I just suggest to you that someone who exercises true authority never has a greater opinion of himself than the ones he serves? Never has a greater opinion of himself than the ones he serves. In fact, he has a lesser opinion. And those who work for him, hopefully, now once again, I need to be careful. Just because a person does the right thing does not mean that everybody loves them. But look at this situation. Look at the humility of this centurion. Jewish leaders didn't like Romans. And yet here they come to Jesus saying, help this guy. He's worthy. He's a what? Now you could say, well, they were selfish because he had given them money to build them a synagogue. He had done stuff for them. But their attitude is they recognized this guy was a servant. And they said he is worthy. But the centurion said of himself, I am not worthy. In fact, this guy had tremendous tremendous humility and he exercised a recognition that the Bible teaches now listen to this it's not just talking about good folks the Bible teaches that all authority comes from finish the sentence God. comes from God all authority comes from God Todo, toda autoridad viene de Dios now, you might say, but there have been some terrible, terrible people who have had authority and power. Do you understand that nobody can come to power unless somebody allows them to come to power? I mean, even in different types of political systems and so on, there is a principle that has to be recognized in Scripture. Oftentimes, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel came under the authority of evil people, but it was the result of sin that they had committed. Now, we can look at the, the development of other countries, and, and I'm not going to try to go into a, a deep historical principle here, but the thing is, if we find ourselves under the authority of someone else, what we are called upon to recognize is that God has allowed that for a purpose, and He can bring good out of it. I've shared with you before, the Bible says, in everything give thanks. It doesn't say that we need to give thanks for everything. The fact is that sometimes when evil people come to power, God has a purpose that is very difficult to see. But the thing is, if we recognize that all authority is given by God, then we recognize that I am in this circumstance so that I can serve God in a way that I couldn't otherwise. And so we need to recognize that if God has placed me under the authority of this person, then I need to serve God in this situation. There are so many people that develop an attitude of, God, I will really serve you as soon as you fix this in my life. And that is not the way you have to approach it. You have to recognize that, God, I will serve you in spite of this situation. I will serve you with hopes that you'll turn it around. But the fact is that, you know, sometimes Christians die in unpleasant circumstances. And then they get to go to heaven. <coughs> and the Bible doesn't promise that everything's going to work out until we get to heaven. And that's our happy ending. Now, God might, might deliver us from some circumstance. But he might allow us to persevere under that circumstance. 
And so we need to recognize that all authority comes from God, but any person in any position of authority needs to hear this and needs to understand. At the end of every powerful person's life, that individual will stand before God and receive judgment for every decision they have ever made. Authority comes from God. And that's why I love the stories. And I've shared this with you just back at Christmas. I, I shared with you, God used the first Caesar who declared himself a God to put Jesus in the right spot to be born to fulfill Scripture so that God in this world would actually come. And so Caesar Augustus sent Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem for the census. And I shared with you how Moses was placed beside Pharaoh to overcome the gods and the authorities of Egypt at the time when Pharaoh was the most powerful man who had ever lived in the world. And God placed Daniel next to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the first world emperor, re recognized by secular historians. And I want you to read from the book of Daniel what God did in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, the first world emperor. The first world empire was the empire of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar knew Daniel, the prophet of God. He was a prophet in Nebuchadnezzar's court. And this is the lesson that God taught to Nebuchadnezzar because all authority comes from God. Look at what it says in Daniel 4. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven. Now I have to ask you, does anybody remember what the period was? Okay, a particular kind of exile. God sent Daniel a dream, and he told, or excuse me, he sent Nebuchadnezzar a dream, and Daniel interpreted it for Nebuchadnezzar. This first world empire was going to lose his mind. Or excuse me, this first world emperor was going to lose his mind. He was going to have a breakdown. He was going to become like a donkey and eat out in the field of grass like a donkey on, his, on all fours. And he was going to be covered with the rain. And he was going to live outside. And he actually lost his mind. And this is what the purpose was according to the book of Daniel. At the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. And my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but He does according to His will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off His hand or say to Him, What have you done? At that time my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I never, now, look, I need to emphasize that. Now, everybody underline now, because he, he had to be brought through this experience. He says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of Heaven. For all His works are true and His ways just. And He is able to humble those who walk in pride. If you read the whole chapter, Nebuchadnezzar stood on his balcony and he said, Look at what I've done! Look at what I have done! And God said, You're crazy. And just so that you'll know it, go eat grass in the field. And it was when his reason came to him. And I just ask you to be reasonable. I love the word humble. It comes from the same root as the word humus, which means what? Dirt. Dirt. And some people think that humility is where you grovel around in the dirt. That's not humility. Humility is when you're down to earth. Okay? 
Somebody who's got their feet firmly planted on the earth is somebody who understands how things really are. Do you know what humility is? Humility is reality. Humility is just being honest. Being humble does not mean that you can't recognize your strengths. Everybody here has strengths. Everybody here, God wants you to be thankful for the gifts and abilities that He has given you. Every one of you have things that you're good at. And you need to glorify God for that and be thankful and rejoice. Being humble doesn't mean telling lies. Oh, I'm not really good at anything. I'm just no good at all. That's not humility. Humility is being honest and truthful. Get your feet down on the ground and understand the truth of everything. And the truth of everything is that everything that you can do well and you're gifted at is a gift of God. I had somebody tell me one time, God's never done a thing for me. I had to work for everything I've got. Who gave you the hands to work? Who gave you the feet to stand on? Who gave you the mind to reason it all out? Who gave you the life to experience any of it? Every bit of good that we've got is a gift of God. And to be humble is just to be truthful with yourself. He came to his reason when he realized God is the one with all authority. So true authority is compassionate. True authority is humble. Have I forgotten about the centurion? No. He was compassionate. He was incredibly humble. Lord, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. I'm not even worthy to come and talk face to face with you. I've asked representatives because I don't consider myself worthy. But here is the most important point of this sermon. True authority is obedient. <laughs> Wait a second, Pastor. You don't understand. People with authority give orders. They don't, they don't follow orders, they give orders. See, this is what the centurion could have said to Jesus. In fact, this is what people would have expected him to say to Jesus. Lord, just give me order because I'm a man with authority. I give orders too. I'm, I'm somebody who's got power. That's not what he said. True authority is obedient. Verdadera autoridad es obediente. And this is where you have to understand... This is why this passage is so important. Jesus marveled. Jesus said, this man is demonstrating true faith. This man is demonstrating true power. This man is demonstrating true authority. So much so that Jesus was amazed. And this word that's used in the scripture is translated amazed, astonished, surprised, as well as marveled. And let me just point out what the man said. Look at verse 8. I told you to pay attention to this. For I also am a man placed what comes next? Over or under? Somebody with authority. Somebody with power. Somebody with ability. Are they over or are they under? Everybody in the world thinks they're over. People with authority are over other people. They're, they put everybody else down. They're over. That's what Jesus said the Gentiles do. That's what greatness is to the Gentiles. But this guy understood what true authority is. What did he say? He said, for I also am a man placed under, under authority. Okay, stop and think about this. How many of you have known somebody who had a position of power and they got fired? One of the things that happens that gets people fired is they start doing things on their own. Okay? The people over them find out about what they're doing and they realize that's not what we want you doing. See, in order to be successful in exercising authority over other people, you have to be under authority. This centurion understood this. Stop and think about it. Who was, in, in the world sense, in the secular sense, in the time of Jesus, who was the most powerful man in all the world who had ever lived up to this point? Caesar. So powerful that he called himself a god. 
This centurion, I mean, a centurion when compared to his other guy, you know, the people around him, he had a lot of power and authority, but compared to Caesar, he was nothing. He was just one of the little cogs down in the mechanism. And, but the thing is, when this centurion, when he acted in obedience to his orders, there was a line of authority. How many of you have ever heard a reference to, the, you know, the, the line of authority? You know, basically this centurion, even though he was just a, a small cog in a huge machine, when he acted in obedience to his superiors, he acted with the authority of Caesar, the most powerful man who had ever lived in human history. Can you please make the application to our own lives? <coughs> True authority is not when you are over, but when you are under. True authority, la verdadera autoridad no es cuando es das ordenes, pero cuando obedeces. I hope I said that. <coughs> True authority. See, if he had been a centurion ordering his men to do this and that, and then his boss found out that it wasn't stuff that was coming down the pike, he would have lost probably his head. But as long as he was under the authority of those over him, he acted with the authority of Caesar. Whose authority are we supposed to be under? And when we live surrendered and submitted and obedient to the authority of God, whose authority do we have in our lives? We have the authority of God. This is why this is such an appropriate message to deliver to as a charge to a new pastor. Because when a pastor stands in the pulpit and he spews his ideas, whose authority does he have? His, <laughs> his own. And really, how's that amount to anything apart from anybody else's? When you share your own ideas, I mean, you may have some wonderful opinions. And God bless you for it. But if there's a disagreement about something and you've got an opinion and someone else has an opinion, you have your opinion. And guess what? Everybody's got a right to their opinion. You've heard that, right? And in this country, that's supposed to be true. But when you speak the word of God, you have an authority that goes all the way to the top. You have an authority. You are speaking with the authority that the demons and the angels recognize. You are speaking with the authority that will last to the end of time. You take the most powerful, the richest. Do you know something? Oh, Christ. Now, his name has escaped me. The guy who did Microsoft. Okay. Gates. Bill Gates. One of these days, Bill Gates will die. And all of his riches will go to someone else. Everybody dies. And then they stand before God. And if a person has lived a life in obedience to the Word of God, in obedience to the will of God as He expresses it to us in our lives, we will stand before God. And He will recognize us for that obedience. You need to understand true authority is obedient. And this is exactly, once again, what Peter said. Look at verse 6 of chapter 5 at the end of your notes. Peter said this, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time. So if God wants to exalt you right before those people who mock you for being a Christian, He can do that. If God wants to have you go through a circumstance where nobody ever recognizes your faithfulness and nobody ever recognizes how obedient you were to God, then you will be standing before God one day and He will honor you before all of heaven. Amen. True authority is compassionate. 
True authority is humble. True authority is obedient. So whatever position God has placed you in that is a position of authority, and you have one. Every parent here has a position of authority. At work, there's probably somebody who looks to you as having authority. If you will be compassionate, humble, obedient to God, you will exercise the power of God in the place that He has put you. How do you become obedient to God? First, you put your faith in Christ. First, you recognize that you're a sinner and Jesus died on the cross. All this week, the world is recognizing that Jesus stepped into human history and did the most important thing that ever has been done. He died on the cross and he rose from the dead. I want you to bow your heads for just a moment, please. Father, in Jesus' name, right now, I want to ask you that you would bring your power into our lives. And Lord, that you would help us to understand what it means to have true power with God. Lord, this is not a power that other people around us necessarily recognize. It's not a power that causes people to come and bow at our feet and recognize how wonderful we are. It's a power that you recognize, and your word even says that the world won't recognize it. If we exercise the true power of God, sometimes the world will hate us because it hated you. But Father, if we care about what's really important, Lord, we are going to want to live a life that exercises the authority of the kingdom of God. And Father, I pray right now, Lord, as we consider ourselves before you, as we examine what we've seen in your word, as we've seen Jesus marvel at the faith of the centurion, Lord, you may have convicted some about being more compassionate. You may have convicted some about being more humble. You may have convicted some about being more obedient. If there's anyone here today that's never trusted Christ, I, re I pray that you would convict them that they need to come under your authority. They need to surrender to your authority right now because you are God. You are the judge. There is only one judge whose judgment truly matters. And Father, I pray that if there's a person who has not trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that right now they would admit to you, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I thank you for coming into the world and dying on the cross for my sins. And I recognize right now that I have no hope apart from you, and I put my trust in you, and I open the door of my life and my heart to you today. <coughs> and the scripture says that with the heart man believes, and with the mouth confession is made. And I want to ask you to share with me that you've trusted Christ today before you leave. And we need to talk to you about being baptized and following the Lord in your life. Christian, you need to recognize that God has called us to have power Jesus said, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses. If we are to have power, we must be under His authority every day. Every day, submitting to Him. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would help us to live lives of power. Lord, lives that demonstrate your compassion, your humility, Lord, the obedience that we need to have to your word and your authority in our lives. And Lord, help us to be like the centurion. Help us to lead lives of such great faith that you will marvel. Lord, help us to get a vision for that. If the centurion could make you marvel, then Lord, we could make you marvel. We could be living lives that would cause you, Lord, to marvel. Lord, help us to have that as our goal. To bring such joy because of the great faith that we're exercising in our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you're dismissed.